Hello everyone and welcome to AccessibilityCon. Thank you for being here today to talk about a topic that concerns all of us. And I'm speaking about accessibility and digital inclusion. But before we talk about accessibility, let's be inclusive ourselves. So for this conference, you have the option to activate subtitles at any time. Oh, and so how do we do it? So Emric, you can click right here in the settings. And yes, here you go. And from there, you will be able to select your preferred language. Voila, you can now follow the conference in the language of your choice. But a question for you also, Emric, why such an event on accessibility? The, the idea of such a conference was born out of the desire to learn. We have a little or no competence in this field and we wanted to learn from great speakers. On paper, the idea was super cool, but in the end, we faced difficulties for inclusion because even in our everyday lives, we don't realize what it means to be truly accessible. We naively started organizing this conference and we tried to do the best we could with our knowledge, which has never stopped growing thanks to the speakers you will meet in a few moments. This conference is organized by the DEFCON Galaxy team and more specifically by Alexia, Adrien, Nathan, Olivier, Maud, Charline, and you, Emric. So uh, we have two tracks that we pre-recorded with our wonderful speakers. And we did that to allow for the subtitling and the translation of each of the sessions. There's uh, a track here in English, and there's also another track in French. The speakers will also be here in the chat to answer your question. So feel free to ask them questions or tell them if you like the, the talks. Yes, and in any case, we would like to thank all of you for your presence today and also thank the speakers who agreed to give us their time and share their knowledge with us. Many thanks also to those who made this conference possible and especially DevApps, Nick Belgium, Microsoft, Sense of Tech and the developer communities, Ejug FR, the Mug.net Nantes and Mugdil. And an important topic for us, the code of conduct. We want it to be a pleasant event for everyone. You can find the full text at accessibilitycon.defcongalaxy.io. In short, we count on you to show respect to all participants and speakers of the conference. We will be, as a, we will be there with you in the chat, and you can contact Charlene and Olivier at team at defcongalaxy.io if you need to. Yes, and before we start, I have a small question for you. For all the participants, please tell us in the chat where you're joining from. Actually, in the organization team and among the speakers, there are people who are based in South Africa, Germany, Belgium, Spain, France, and also from the USA. So if you can put your city in the chat, then we will have an idea of uh, where you're watching the conference from. From now on, we just have to wish you a very good conference. Don't hesitate to ask your questions live in, live in the chat, available right here. Oh, sorry, it's my turn. And of course, do not hesitate to share your reactions uh, with us. And you can use the hashtag AccessibilityCon. Have fun. Hello, Francisca. How are you today? Hello, Maud. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm I'm really good today. Um, how about you? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing very well today. I'm very happy that uh, we are um, speaking together and launching this conference. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome to the Accessibility Con, and uh, we are very glad to have you. Thank you so, very much. Thank you. So today, uh, I know that you're going to tell us about disabilities are ubiquitous. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing this. And um, yeah, feel free to also describe uh, the definition of ubiquitous because it's a difficult to help. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Let's start. 
<clears throat> Hello everyone uh, and welcome to my presentation uh, Disabilities are Ubiquitous. Um, my name is Frances Gaskov. Uh, I'm working as a business program manager uh, for Microsoft um, and uh, I'm also responsible for the topics uh, accessibility um, and sustainability in my team uh, and I also um, um, care for other um, topics uh, around uh, accessibility um, at Microsoft um, in other teams uh, because I'm um, blind since birth and so um, accessibility uh, I need uh, every day in my life and um, it never stops. <laughs> for me um, and so it's really really um, yeah it's it's really uh, important for me that uh, accessibility is everywhere um, to use. Um, next slide please. So <clears throat> I wanted to start um, with a statement uh, of um, Microsoft CEO uh, Satya Nadella. Um, he said um, technology should technology should not degrade humanity but provide new levels of inclusiveness. In fact, I'm most excited about accessibility. And that's that's the thing uh, I really uh, I really am supported. Um, uh, because accessibility is everywhere uh, in, in technology and also in our society. Um, accessibility um, is not just for people with a disability, um, it's for all of us. Um, for example, you can have a um, situa situative um, disability um, when you um, break your arm, for example, you can just use one arm um, for a longer time. Um, or uh, if you have a um, or if you have a baby, you have to care um, about um, and you you have, to, for example, to to buy something and you. Um, um, you you have all your stuff um, you you buy it and um, you had uh, you have to um, uh, you have to go um, the stairs for example um, you you have not not really hands free um, or if yeah if if you get older. Uh, and you maybe couldn't see everything um, really good, um, or you have um, uh, you you, you um, lose your hearing uh, more and more. Um, there are many things um, you um, you can. Um, <clears throat> Um, there are many um, situations um, you could um, have a disability for a short time. Uh, also, uh, if you are in a noisy environment and you wanted to show uh, to um, listen to a video, um, what the person in the video is saying, um, you have to. Um, uh, it's it's really good. Uh, that you can switch on subtitles, uh, that you can um, uh, li listen to the video uh, what's on uh, and you can hear the voice um, speaking. If, if you have, for example, um, a, a little baby and you, you have to care for it, um, in uh, in an environment uh, where you couldn't um, uh, where you couldn't um, go um, uh, where where you have for example um, steps 
um, you have to to move uh, with with your baby. Um, that's really hard, and you also have to um, to to see um, if if you can. Um, uh, if if something is um, children friendly and everything, um, you have to look for. Um, also, if you are in a noisy environment uh, and you have to, uh, you, you wanted to listen to a um, video and, and watch it, um, you need subtitles uh, because you um, uh, you can't hear the, the voice of the video, what people um, speaking. Um, and so subtitles are not just for people with loss of hearing, um, but also for all of us, uh, very helpful. <clears throat> and these are um, a little um, ex um, examples of how disability um, is everywhere. Um, and you, you can also make the difference, uh, for example, if you if you add uh, alternative text to your pictures and make your programs and websites and everything um, you have um, accessible. Uh, also presentations, documents, uh, you can you can also um, make it accessible for all of us. Um, for example, in, um, in in Microsoft products, you can use the accessibility checker uh, in. Um, uh, I um, I will show you later. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, <laughs> um, you you can um, you can use it everywhere uh, every. Um, time when you prepare documents and emails. Um, so in the, uh, in the next slide, uh, I will show you how I use technology as a blind person. Um, I'm working with a braille display. Um, it's it's a little um, it's a little uh, um, <clears throat> uh, in with, with this, uh, I can read uh, about what's on the screen. Um, and I have also a text to speech software, which also reads out loud to me what's on the screen. Uh, now, um, on the next slide uh, in the video, I will show to you um, how I use technology like Microsoft Teams. Next slide, please. Now I have a Teams meeting, so I will open the start menu with the Win key. Um, then I will type Teams in the search box and I will confirm with Enter. Failed low quote suction left quote edit type and text. T A S Microsoft Teams app Enter. Anita Martin vertical bar Microsoft Teams. Anita Martin. So now I have a meeting and um, I will join the meeting by selecting it uh, with the shortcut control and two to go to the chats. Control to chat list navigation region, chat list review. Chat. I navigate with the uh, arrow keys. Meeting chat recording available recording the center. Recording, recording chat content main region type. So the chat is open now and I will um, go through the uh, through the chat uh, to click on join um, with shift and tap. New meeting to two buttons, join button to activate press space bar. Enter. Recording vertical bar Microsoft Teams button to activate press space bar. So now the now I'm in the meeting and uh, I will navigate with the um, with the arrow keys 
um, to the message um, menu uh, if there are some new messages in the chat. More options, but send button to act, act type message, close right pane button. Me ah, there are uh, some messages. Anita Martin. Welcome. <laughs> so I will react on the message um, via uh, clicking uh, on the enter key um, to select the reaction menu. Enter message actions tool bar like what? There are some possibilities um, to react on a message uh, like and I go uh, with the right arrow key to the next bottom. Hard button. Hard. I will react with a hard. Enter hard. Undo hard. Escape. Need I have also other possibilities to experience a meeting in a good way. Um, for example, I can mute or unmute myself um, by uh, clicking the shortcut uh, Control Shift and M. Control Shift M. Your microphone is muted. Control Shift M. Your microphone is unmuted. And I can also turn my camera on and off via the shortcut Control Shift and O. Control Shift O. Your camera is turned on. Control Shift O. Your camera is turned off. So now I have my meeting. Thanks for watching. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, now, now you saw um, how I use uh, technology like Microsoft Teams. Um, you saw also that I just worked uh, with my keyboard. Uh, I don't use a mouse um, and I use always um, shortcuts. Um, and that's really important for me um, because I'm really fast with um, shortcuts uh, on the keyboard. Um, you also maybe see um, that I have um, two um, dots uh, on my keyboard, uh, one on the um, B and one on the five key. Um, and that's um, for me to orientate myself a little bit better uh, on the keyboard, but it's an individual thing. Um, you can um, do it um, however you want. <clears throat> so um, now <laughs> I will show you um, how my um, screen reader uh, will read out a PowerPoint slide. And next slide, please. Slide two title right bracket most important information left bracket slide two content right bracket left bracket table right bracket left bracket smart art graphic right bracket this diagram shows a three step process first information second analyze thread action information analyze action left bracket picture right bracket picture of one of the areas in the Microsoft Technology Center in Munich filled with nice furniture and technology demos left bracket picture right bracket hero female let's rock left bracket slide two notes right bracket so, um, and um, this <laughs> this was uh, how my screen reader um, read out a PowerPoint presentation slide for me. Um, it's uh, it's really important to know um, that I can uh, experience a PowerPoint um, as a, a normal person, as a sighted person. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as a sighted person, but um, it's it's also sometimes a little bit um, different uh, for me. Um, I need um, maybe um, some more seconds to get all the informations uh, which are shown. Um, and uh, it's also very helpful <clears throat> for me to um, to get the information and the documents um, in um, 
uh, before a meeting start or um, before a workshop. Um, so I get the chance to prepare myself a little bit more um, to the meeting um, because um, then then I can just uh, concentrate myself on what the person um, who presents uh, is saying. Um, and I, uh, I read the documents before. So <clears throat> um, now um, uh, I prepared uh, also um, a th uh, three tips uh, for you, um, how you can collaborate uh, with a person um, who has a disability. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. Um, the first thing, uh, ask what you want to know. Um, it's really, really important um, for us to talk to each other more, um, to get more into um, exchange, um, talk about, hey, what, what do you need? Um, what, um, what's, what's your, um, yeah, um, what about um, yourself? How, how you how you are um, doing, um, and so we can we can uh, make barriers. Uh, we, we can throw barriers away. <laughs> um, the second um, thing is uh, use accessibility checker and uh, think about um, that your documents and your presentations and your websites and your programs are all accessible for people with disabilities and for everyone else. Um, because it's so, so, so important um, that everyone can participate uh, in, in web pages, in programs, in, this, in, in everything. Um, and so, yeah, it's so important um, to to learn how you can um, be more accessible. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, the third thing is um, you can use uh, like uh, words like "see." Uh, we will see each other soon. Um, let's let's go or everything else. Um, you can use it um, talking to a person who has a disability. Um, it's really important um, that that you don't um, over um, yeah that, <laughs> um, that that you don't um, think about. Uh, can I say something wrong to the person? Um, can I hurt? Um, the person, if I would say, um, can you see this or um, are are you um, yeah look for this or so? Um, it's it's really important that you you talk um, like yeah every like um, you would talk to every person um, in in your environment. Um, and so it's really, really important. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and um, one thing uh, I wanted also to say, um, you can also make a difference. Um, in, for example, if you if you post a picture uh, on uh, LinkedIn or on um, Instagram or whatever uh, in social media, uh, you can add an alternative text to the picture. Um, it's it, it makes possible um, to people who can't see the picture uh, to know what's on the picture. It's a it's a little bit uh, it's a little text. Um, you describe the picture to the blind person, um, and. Um, there's uh, in every social media the possibility to um, to add an alternative text um, to pictures. Um, you you can um, I can I can send you uh, resources. Uh, I can send you some some links um, on the. Um, I can send you some links uh, with informations about alternative text. Um, 
yeah <laughs> so um that was my presentation um disabilities are ubiquitous um i hope you get a little bit an experience um and you learned um that people around you um are also um uh, are um pr providing uh, from accessibility and that uh, accessibility is all around us thank you very much francisca for this talk and uh, now just a little question um uh, could you tell us a little bit more about where we can find some more information about this topic? Uh, you can either tell us now if something comes to mind or you can share the information uh, with us and we can share it with the participants in the chat. Um, I have some sources uh, I will um, I will send to you and then you can um, share it uh, in the chat. Um, but the audience um, has also possibilities to um, follow me uh, on LinkedIn or um, on Instagram and then we can um, exchange about um, the topic uh, I talked about. <laughs> and then Perfect. they can ask me, <laughs> then they can ask me questions. <laughs> that sounds good. So thank you for your talk uh, and uh, thank you for being here. We will uh, start soon with the next talk by Rory Preddy. The talk is going to be about programming for accessibility. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you for being here today with us. Um, so could you just introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to, to talk about today uh, for this uh, Accessibility Con um, conference? Thanks, Alexia. And, and it's so exciting to be here, to be part of this uh, conference. And what I've got today is to talk to you about programming for accessibility. And I've done this talk in multiple different time zones and iterations, and it is a, a fascinating journey to show you how easy it is to get starting with programming for accessibility. We're going to touch on AR, we're going to touch on some tooling, some basics behind the accessibility, and then we're going to give you some really nice homework to go through and play around and see how you can get started. So yeah, I'm eager to get started. 
Thanks, Flory, and uh, I'm going to, to let you do your, your such amazing talk. Great. Okay, so I've got my little clicker here, and I'm going to be using it. Uh, you should be able to see my screen, and everything is uh, working. And we've got some nice uh, examples. You can follow me also on at Rory Pretty on Twitter. I do 50% Azure updates, 50% memes. So it's always a nice, entertaining uh, view on my Twitter profile. So let's get started. So a little bit about me. So I'm going to stand up here so you can see. So I've got achondroplasia or dwarfism. So I'm about four foot one, which is about 120 centimeters. I forget what France uses in the metric system or we use, you know, whatever Britain used at the time. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty short and I bolt on my accessibility requirements and I have been bolting on my accessibility requirements requirements for many years. So this is my midlife crisis, my BMW 335i. And you can see there I've got my car pedals on it and I bolted them on and I, well, kind of like bolted them directly. They've only failed like once, <laughs> don't tell anyone. Um, but, um, and this really is the, the crux of the, the talk I wanna do that a lot for many years, accessibility has been uh, bolt on. And you can see there, I'll make a plan. Um, here I am lecturing at a university and here I am um, trying to get coffee at uh, one of my previous employments. And um, it, it really is uh, about making a plan when you have accessibility requirements. But what we've noticed in, um, in today's time is that accessibility doesn't have to be a bolt on. So I wanna introduce you to someone called the Hydra. And what the Hydra is, it's called the Bug Hydra. Because when you have a bug, you chop its head off and then um, you, you're expecting the, the problem to be solved, but then another head just grows uh, back on. And the reason behind the bug hydra is because we're doing everything bolt on. Whereas what we should have done is um, handled our bugs or our accessibility requirements from the beginning. Now the question I get asked often is, but Rory, how do I do that? It, it seems like so daunting and this is really the crux of the, uh, the presentation I'm doing today. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. There's multiple tricks of the trade that you can do to get uh, that Hydra killed. Because if you don't kill the Hydra, what happens is you're gonna live in an empathy bubble. So what is an empathy bubble? Now, I'm four foot one, and I can guarantee you a lot of you haven't lived at, uh, at four foot one. Um, so you, you don't know what it's like to, uh, to experience um, accessibility requirements for everyone, but everyone has their own unique um, uh, accessibility requirements. So you want to chop the, the, the hardware's head off, but you also want to be able to pop the empathy bubble and understand how your audience or your customers or your developers can handle accessibility. Else, what happens if you don't understand, you don't pop that bubble, you're gonna fail. You can see here, he has a, a, an example of a failure. And well, how, how does someone in a wheelchair get past those three steps? And that was because the individual created that accessibility requirement without truly understanding their audience's requirements. So I've got a plan. First, we're gonna define accessibility and what isn't accessible. Then we're gonna understand your uh, organization's unique accessibility, uh, accessibility motivators, stick or carrot. And then we're gonna set achievable interim milestones and then tooling. I'm gonna to give you some nice toys to play around with it. And then finally, how to measure, improve and automate using AI and DevOps on around your uh, accessibility journey. So first let's define what accessibility is and what accessibility isn't. Now normally people, when they think of accessibility, they think disability. We're gonna to get to what the definition of disability is now. But here at Microsoft, we define accessibility as the first start of innovation. And it's hard to uh, kind of work that out if you haven't been part of access an accessible design process though. But once you start to think in an accessible way, uh, you include product and service design with inclusive design, you have accessibility compliance, you get increased productivity, and then innovation. Because accessibility is the design of product services and environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully ex experience it. That means that we don't program for disabilities, but we program for innovation. 
And it starts also with the definition that disability is not a personal health condition. Now, when you go to a doctor and you say, oh, I'm not feeling too good. And the doctor looks at you and goes, I think you have the disability. That doesn't happen. The only time that you feel disabled is when you have mismatched human interactions. Now, I've got one of those um, scales that measure BMR. And uh, I've recently, in this COVID climate, actually lost a lot of weight, 16 kilos. But I decided to buy one of the scales. And I got into the scale, and I, I typed in my weight at the time, 65 kilos, uh, 4 foot 1, or 120 centimeters. And it had a picture on there of, of a little crawling baby and, and a man. And I thought, this is not going to end well. So I put there the baby, um, and uh, I jumped on, and it did its little AI. And it came back and said, you are obese. And I was like, what? No. Um, and I felt disabled because the people who had designed the, the product and with the AI hadn't actually uh, created um, the inclusive design and included me in the design of the product. And that's really the definition of disability. It's a mismatch human interaction. So now that we have accessibility and disability, let's also look at how you can do accessibility design principles. So introducing WCAG, which is the Web Center for Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and this really has, and I'm not going to go too much into detail with it, but it's got four guidelines, which is perceivable. Can you see it? So it defines a principle of creating accessible software as it needs to be perceivable. And that's if you're visually impaired, um, or if you uh, a, a silver generation, so an elderly person, you need to be able to create your software so people can see it. Then operable, can you use it? Um, try uh, navigating through your website with just your keyboard, and you'll see exactly how uh, operable is a very key important factor with accessible software. Understandable, can you understand it? And what we've noticed also now is accessibility also includes ADHD. So if you have a mouse pointer that kind of shakes there or uh, does something that stresses people, you're not really making something understandable because you're, you're stressing the individual. And lastly, robust. It won't break future technology. So if you create an accessible software, then you, won't, um, uh, you can't create it that if something fundamentally changes, it will break your software. For example, responsive design. If you have a, a, a mobile phone and you turn it, and around, it shouldn't actually break. It should be responsive. And that's really all I want to go through in WCAG. There are a lot more features. And in the demo, I'm going to show you how to uh, go in and check which WCAG uh, design principles your website uh, follows. Now we've got our definitions done. Let's look at some motivators. Now, there is the stick and carrot. So uh, if how do you get a donkey to follow your instructions? You can either take a stick to it, do, 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 or you can give it a carrot. Now, the stick is the legislation that is being uh, driven primarily by the US first, uh, 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act and the EU Parliament Directory of uh, Digital Accessibility that says this year, all civil facing, so uh, government facing or civil websites have to be WCAG 2.1 AA compliant. All like Canada did, you get a $100,000 fine per day. And that's a big stick to actually be driving with people. And at Microsoft, we have that requirement. So if you have software or a website or um, even a document, you have to make it uh, compliant. There's also the carrot and uh, the altruistic view. And this is really best summed up by Bill Gates that says, for most of human history, we put our innovative capacity in improving the quantity of life. More, more, bigger, bigger. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving the quality of life. Looking and holistically creating better experiences for everyone. Remember what I said to you about accessibility? It's uh, everyone can enjoy your product. And once you have that mindset, um, around uh, uh, that it's a carrot rather than the stick, you can start being more aware of others' difficulties. Remember the inclusive design? So it starts with the emotional engagement with your audience. You start with, with pity, you move into sympathy, you go through empathy. Rory, yes, I remember the empathy bubble. And then finally you do compassion. You, you create that awareness. But how do you create that awareness? You do that by uh, understanding the... Uh, persona spectrums of the people that are using your product. So this is a nice persona spectrum lab. 
that is run by DQ Labs, one of our partners. You can see there's Claudia, Ashley, and Ron. And Ron is an 82-year-old, retired, multiple conditions, arthritis, losing his hearing, cataracts, hip replacements, doesn't use any assistive technology. And what it does is you take that persona spectrum and you run these labs here. And uh, these individuals here would go in as Ron and try and use your website and see the difficulties that Ron would experience with it. Now you can go in and get all of those persona spectrums. They're freely available um, at alphagov.github.io accessibility personas. And then you can start to actually shatter that, um, that empathy bubble. So this is part of inclusive design. So you recognize exclusion, you have your persona spectrums, then you solve for one extent to many. Now, once you've got those persona spectrums, you need to acknowledge the overlap of those persona spectrums. So for example, Ron, Ron is 82. Ron has failing eyesight, but Ron isn't visually impaired. He's just got failing eyesight. Um, so Ron is the same persona spectrum as someone who was born probably with a cognitive uh, um, uh, problem with their, their eyesight. Um, and that means that if you solve it for Ron with his eyesight, you're going to solve and extend that to someone uh, who also has visual impairment. And then learn from diversity. Now, this is a key uh, differential with inclusive design. What it means is that when you uh, finish your persona spectrum and your inclusive design process, to get uh, surveys and feedback to make sure you can go back to the original process and change it. And it's best actually summed up with this nice little persona spectrum example that I've got here. So this is a person who was born or uh, an amputee who doesn't have use of their right arm. So you can see there I've got one arm, but it's in the same spectrum as an arm injury or a new parent. So the arm injury might be a motorbike accident, but the new parent uh, is cr uh, cradling their uh, newborn. And I know what you're thinking, but a new parent isn't actually disabled. But I promise you, if you've ever been a parent, you're financially sleep deprived, um, uh, you know, mentally, you, you're, you stretch to your, your complete uh, um, limits. Now, if you go to your manager or your customers or your stakeholders and you say, I want to code for that person with, uh, with limited use on the one arm, and uh, your manager goes, yeah, but uh, how many people is that? That's not a huge number. Yeah, so this is the US Center for uh, Disability Statistics. And the, the person who has permanent uh, an amputee, only there's 26,000 in America. Uh, but the temporary disability, people who have uh, hurt their arm, um, is, there's 13 million. Now, the situational um, uh, accessibility requirements is an, an additional 8 million. That means in that persona spectrum alone, you have 21 million. Now, if you go to your manager or your stakeholders or your customers and you say, now I can code it, then it makes sense. But when you look at the holistic view of everyone who has accessibility requirements, there's a billion people right now in the world with accessibility requirements. When you take your friends, family, people who are heavily invested in those individuals, there's three to four billion people that have uh, uh, requirements to ask you to build accessibility software. That's half the world. So these persona spectrums shed light on exactly the importance of creating your software according to your audience and your requirements. So we've got our persona spectrums, then we take a, and we superimpose them on your app journey. So this is a ticketing scenario that you have the registration and it's a flight ticket. I, I do remember flying, one day I'll get back there. You register, uh, register you navigate uh, on your shopping cart wizard, and then you check out uh, very similar to a lot of the classic wizard-based systems that we have in software. So you, you, you have your site landing, your preference, registration, help, login, search flights to get your flight, add to cart, help, check out ticketing, and then you have your experience, your survey that may or may not get thrown into the ether. Then you superimpose your persona spectrums. You can see there now everything changes because you, you're living in that soul of the, those individuals now. Now I don't have access to my, my one arm, so how do, I, how do I log in? And I need responsive design in the side landing. My preferences need to be font and color options, uh, maybe a, a capture and registration, single sign-in, a help desk so I can phone up someone if I'm not uh, able to use it, a callback help, one button access, voice search, SMS and email for ticketing, one button access, and then right at the end, AI adjustment. And we can work out the AI because right now we can work out, wait a second, 
did you have accessibility requirements? Did we meet your requirements? And then adjust the entire screen flow dynamically to cater for that person. And that's where the innovation comes though. So remember right at the beginning is understanding your unique uh, milestones and motivators, creating that inclusive design. Um, and then right at the end is creating that flow of innovation into your system. So now that we've defined the, uh, the, the journeys, let's look at milestones and how to incorporate this into a DevOps and an agile project. So normally here you have your, your wireframe, which is your uh, uh, design of your interface. You've got your product backlog, which is your tasks and your, um, your actual work. Then you've got your sprint backlog, and this is using agile uh, sprint. And then you've got your rinse and repeat with scrum and sprint. You've got your shippable product. And then we bolt on accessibility right at the end. And we've really kind of seen how difficult that is to do. Um, but we have, a, we have a big drive in the industry to shift left. Now, what does shift left mean? And we've seen that now with DevOps, with programming. Shift left means move all of the investment from a large scale right at the end bolt on to a smaller scale integration and being able to do it throughout the, the process of the uh, design of your application. You can see here, we've got a large investment in the traditional um, design and then a small investment if we were going to do that as part of the shift lab. And what it changed, it changes now your, uh, your process flow to incorporate accessibility throughout the entire design process. When you're doing your wireframe, use one of our tools to actually check, is it uh, WCAG compliant? Then in the product backlog, check whether you're doing compliance. Um, when you do your sprint and scrum in your DevOps pro uh, process and your pipeline before you ship it out, have your PR on GitHub or uh, your Git repo, actually run one of our uh, rules um, to check whether you are uh, compliant. And that's the, the shift left. And now we have everything in place that we can actually start to look at our tools. And I've got so many exciting tools that I wanna show you around here. It's like opening up a, a candy store and, and showing this. So the first thing I wanna show you is accessibility insights. And we're gonna go through a demo. I'll stop this and we'll go through the demo, but accessibility insights is the core tool that Microsoft uses to check all of our web, Android, yeah, we do Android also, Windows, CRCD, um, uh, GitHub Actions. We've open sourced this tool and made it available for you. And it, uh, this is the same tool that we use to check www.microsoft.com, uh, uh, docs on Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Learn, anything that you can see there that is accessible, we're mandated and given the culture to use this tool. And now you can also with Accessibility Insights. It's a Chrome and Edge plugin, and you can also run it um, standalone, which is really exciting. We just launched also the Accessibility Insights for GitHub Actions. I'm gonna show you a nice Azure DevOps demo uh, coming up soon. So once you've got accessibility insights, how do you incorporate that into your DevOps process? Now you do that by using the same engine that accessibility insights um, called Xcore, and it's a JavaScript library. You can use NPM um, and then scans your rendered DOM. Now you can call this JavaScript library from Java, from Python, from Ruby. I've spoken about this library in every single language you can imagine. It uh, reports the, uh, the, the back, the results as JSON, and it's the same engine that Accessibility Insights using. So you, you take your, uh, your developer, your Azure pipe, uh, DevOps pipeline, or your GitHub Actions, you do your Yarn test or your Maven test um, on your um, output TypeScript or Java, um, sorry, um, JavaScript, and then it prints out using your um, Chrome driver or Selenium, your test uh, engine, the actual results. You get a nice little DevOps pipeline that you can see there that the .NET test failed. And you can go in and check some really nice live examples, github.com forward slash Microsoft forward slash X dash pipeline samples. And there's some really great examples there using the DQ engine um, that we use in Accessibility Insights. And you can see there, then you can get that dashboard view and you can see exactly what your team is doing and whether they're complying to your accessibility uh, requirements. We also have Immersive Reader, and this is very dear to me because this is this is actually incorporated in all of Microsoft um, Microsoft Learning Tools, Microsoft Office, Edge, and also a lot of our AR tools. And what Accessibility, um, sorry, Immersive Reader does, it um, scans a page, 
and it gives you a immersive view. As you can see there, clicking on immersive reader, and it converts your text that you see there into um, easy to read text. Uh, it caters for people with ADHD, uh, reading uh, difficulties, and it gives you the ability to translate in real time your text. And I'm gonna show you a nice little programming example of how to do this with limited or um, with no uh, changes to your underlying tooling. And what I'm trying to show you is that if you can't fix your um, accessibility requirements um, or accessibility issues at the beginning, you can always take Immersive Reader, pop a little button there, and you've got an a accessible website without having to break your system. To so yeah, so Immersive Reader is actually built into um, nearly, nearly every tool that Microsoft has. You can see that this is Teams, Microsoft Teams. And this has Immersive Reader. We've got a OneNote, Word, Excel, everything that you can think of. And uh, I'm going to do a demo a little bit later also on how to get started uh, with uh, Immersive Reader. So what can immersive reader do? It can identify language. So for early childhood uh, reading, this is great. Um, it can also translate into 60 different languages. I'm gonna show you how to do it in uh, uh, Palavu Francais. Um, pronunciation, so it can read it out. And then syllables. And finally, it also picture tools. And this is built into your office products. So once you have immersive reader and you can plug it into any website, you can also use um, other cognitive services, Azure Cognitive Services. So this is a nice little cognitive service called Computer Vision. And what this does, it scans in and gives you captioning with, um, with real world kind of similarities. And we, we entered into the Facebook no caps uh, challenge. And in that challenge, uh, we beat the uh, a human readable um, uh, take on uh, captioning. You can see here, right at the end there, it says such an adult, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, posing for a photo. It understands the context of the photo better than a human being. We're gonna give you a nice example uh, a little bit later with some demos on how to do that. So great, now it's demo time. and I've got a few demos uh, to do with you. I'm just gonna get out of my PowerPoint presentation here so I can get, and uh, this is a Mac and I know the irony is not lost on me that I'm a Java developer working for Microsoft uh, on a Mac. Um, so I've got Chrome here and I wanna go first and I wanna teach you WCAG. <laughs> yeah, I know Rory, yeah, that's a, a small little thing. So this is a nice little website. So w3.org, um, why demos uh, and bad before home. And this is the inaccessible and accessible before and after demonstration to show you about accessibility insights. And this is a city lights um, uh, tourist site here. And you can see here in the inaccessible site here, we have what looks like a, an accessible website. And if you click on the accessible view here, it looks exactly the same. Because what has happened is the programmer has done some dust, disasterly uh, uh, code at the background there, and he hasn't actually followed WCAG principles. So if you see here, and we go to uh, inspect, I'm using Chrome, uh, and you can see here, there isn't a alt tag uh, for that, that image. We also have, when we look at the um, the list items here, when we go inspect here, what they've done with the list items is they've just used BR tags. They haven't actually used LR tags. So they've done terrible things. Now, if you have a screen reader software, it wouldn't be able to read that. So even though this looks accessible, it isn't accessible. So what do we do here? So first we, we've got the, the accessibility insights Chrome plugin plugged in, so I can click on that. So let me go back to the inaccessible uh, uh, version. Um, sorry, the accessible version. And if I go into accessibility insights, it gives me the option to, to use landmarks, tab stops, uh, headings, color, automated checks, all of those things I can actually put in and do that. But I wanna show you something called FastPass. Now FastPass checks whether you were, were CAD compliant very quickly. So I go FastPass and this should be were CAD compliant and it says, yeah, you are, you are compliant, great. But if I do the uh, inaccessible website, and I go into FastPass, I'm expecting to see quite a few violations, but, um, and it gives you a report on the uh, violation. You can see the color contrast is incorrect. WCAG uh, 1.4.3, and you can get, you can click through more information, and it'll tell you all around the different colors and what the violation is. HTML lang, it doesn't have an HTML uh, language um, image alt. There's 33 different images there that don't have alt tags and you can click through that. Um, and then uh, we also have right at the bottom, 
uh, we have uh, link names, ensure link names have discernible text, and then select names, ensure select elements have accessible names. Now, that's great, and that's a report, and I can export that result there and send it, but I can also go, if I go into Chrome, um, I can go into, and it gives me the visual representation of that issue. Now, I can click on there, and it will say, there is no alt tag there, and I can go file that issue, watch this, file the issue, I go straight into GitHub, and I file the issue. And this is a great way for your testers to test uh, the, uh, the um, and to do really intricate tests. You can still do the um, export results. And I can go in there and it'll tell me everything that I need to fix there. I've got inspect HTML, copy failure details, file the issue, and then fix one of the following to get that working. So that's one of the things ac about accessibility insights. We also have the ability to check navigation. Now, if I go to the accessible version of the website and I click through on um, uh, tab stops, so I'm gonna click on tab stops. Now it's gonna switch on tab stop. Now if I tab through here, I can see that I can navigate this website pretty easily and it's all the tab stops are correct. But the uh, inaccessible version, someone did something very uh, terrible. They, they changed the uh, tab stops without doing a proper job. And if I switch on tab stops here with accessibility insights uh, here, you'll see there that it is not navigable, it goes nowhere. Um, and it's the same with uh, the uh, landmarks um, and the color contrast. There's so many nice little tools there that you can do. We also have the ability to do an assessment. And this is the full assessment that allows you to go through all of the features um, in a very uh, low level detail to make sure that you can get even to the AA, AAA compliance of uh, WCAG around that. And it's got details of each one there on how to get started and how to test uh, with design patterns and a lot of nice features. And this is the same library that we use in DevOps. Um, so Rory, you're gonna show me a DevOps demo? I am right now. So let's let's go out of that. And I've got my, my nice little uh, DevOps demo here. And this is a, a little um, Maven test. I am a Java developer. And this test here tests this website. This is a page with no violation. And I've got the X engine running here, example unit tests. And it's uh, gonna set it up. It's gonna test that page. And I can actually just go in and I'll do one test here. I can just go run the test and it's gonna create, if everything works fine, it's gonna bring up my Chromium driver, test that website there, and then come back to me and going, yay, it worked fine. And I can run all of those tests there against uh, the X core and I can get the results back for all of my tests uh, also. So they can actually run there. And this you can plug in to your DevOps process. And I've already got that working um, in uh, Chrome. So let's go back here and I've got that in my pipelines here. So I've plugged that exact website there into an Azure DevOps uh, pipeline job. And you can see there, I've got my Maven jobs there that they run through all of the uh, actual physical tests there, boop, 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 right at the end there. Um, and then you've got your tests and then you can create your dashboard here. Let's go for our dashboard, our dashboard summary. You can get a nice view of your dashboard summaries um, with that, uh, you can see there I've got that and I ran this earlier today around my tests there and I've got all my tests running 100% completion for those tests. And this is the, the same um, engine that can run in uh, Java.NET, Ruby, JavaScript. It's the X pipelines using the DQ engine. So that's the, the DevOps pipeline. You push it into there or GitHub Actions and it starts to test. But what, what about AI, Rory? You promised me that we we're gonna do a demo. Uh, around AI, and I do have a nice uh, demo. The first demo I want to show you is that you can get started now, and we're going to do a nice little challenge. You're going to put it on your Twitter sphere. I want you to try and beat this AI. Now, this AI, is, uh, remember what I said, the no caps uh, challenge, it actually beat uh, human uh, captioning. So I'll show you what I mean with that. So here is someone, and you can see there, that's an individual playing baseball, and I want to see what the human view of this and the AI. So the captioning there will analyze the image. Now for me, it's someone playing baseball. But if I put that there and you read an alt text saying someone playing baseball, that won't really help. But the AI says, I think it's a baseball player preparing to swing a bat. What it does, it takes linguistics and also uh, analysis of the image and it combines them um, with multiple AI models to give you the, a proper captioning of the system. This is the same captioning we're using with PowerPoint and Excel with Edge, and we're building it into it, and you can use it with Azure Cognitive Services computer vision. 
You can go to uh, captionbot at demo.azurewebsites.net. Uh, and we're going to put it on the Twitter sphere also. And then you're going to be able to play around with it. So I've also got a nice demo that I've coded in here. So let's open up that demo file and let's go open recent. And we want to find the uh, caption bot there. So that's the X call uh, thing there. Uh, let's go here more. And I want to go computer vision. And this is the computer vision that uh, samples that come with the Azure Cognitive Services. So this is the cog uh, computer vision quick start here. And I've got a nice little image here that I've got uh, printed text so it can read printed text. And I've also got it uh, looking at that um, uh, Barack Obama selfie. So if I look at the Barack Obama, let's have a nice little exercise here. I'm gonna copy this image. Um, and this is a Wikipedia freely available image here. And uh, let's go back into Chrome. And if I paste that in here, Let's see if you can caption that better. So who, who are these people and what are they doing? So now I put it into my Azure Cognitive Services, the, the demo that I've done there, and I, uh, I run this. And it should actually come back and tell me who those people are and, and uh, what the captioning is for that, the, that uh, image. And I've got my Cognitive Services already set up on Azure. It's analyzing the image there and it's gonna do, um, and it says there, Wow, okay, um, um, I found Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Barack Obama are posing for a picture with confidence uh, of, that's pretty high confidence because it's 0.5. It also has a person's smile, human face, it analyzes their male of age 58, 47, and 51. I'm quite sure Obama was 58 because I think his presidency really kind of aged him. Um, uh, it also looks for sensitive information, is adult or has racy content, the, com the colors, the celebrities. And then I've also got a printed text uh, image there that you can actually use. Let's go look at that uh, printed text demo. Uh, let's go back here, do, 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 printed text. You can see what computer vision uh, can do also. Let's copy that, go back into that picture and uh, paste that in. And this is a, a printed text of a nutritional facts. And you can see that's cut off the calories there and it's got some fuzz there, but it actually printed out the, uh, the text there and got everything uh, correct around that. So computer vision is so really powerful. It can show you exactly what you're looking at and you can take all your images, you can scan through millions of images and captioning them using alt tags. The next demo I've got is Immersive Reader. Now I've got, uh, you can get started on Immersive Reader um, on the actual Immersive Reader website. So this is Immersive Reader. You can go to azure.microsoft.com um, and, and search for Immersive Reader and it'll do that. And I've got a last little demo uh, I've got here. Now I'm gonna just swap my screen up because I wanna read you this back in uh, French because I wanna show you some of the translation services. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. I'm gonna go share my screen, share, uh, Chrome tab, share audio, and then I'm gonna go Immersive Reader. Now watch this here. So I'm gonna go, um, it says immersive readers and Azure Cognitive Services for developers uh, who wanna embed inclusive capabilities. I wanna do this in French. Now try that under this button here, you can put on your website. So I'm gonna show you another demo of how I did that. I'm gonna click through here and it takes that text and now it creates an immersive experience. And you should be able to hear that. If not, I'll- Immersive Reader is an Azure Cognitive Service for developers. So that's one, but what about French? So uh, I wanna translate. Um, and I want to translate that into uh, French, Francais. Oh, it's got everything already in uh, French. Um, I want to go and, uh, oh, it's got that in French. I want it rather, because now I'm a little bit lost. I don't speak French. Well, not yet. Uh, and I want to go try it out. I want to do this in English, but I want to translate to French from there. Uh, there, I want to choose a language and I want to go to uh, French here. Uh, Canadian French, no, French France, and the whole document. And now it can actually do. Immersive Reader est un service cognitif Azure pour les développeurs qui souhaitent intégrer. Wow, and I did that with li limited effort. Um, and I can also go in here and go line focus um, and uh, picture dictionary. And um, I can actually do um, three lines and break it up into nouns, syllables change the font text. Um, and this is this is so easy to put it into your uh, your immersive reader uh, uh, cognitive services. So I've got this here. Let's open 
a uh, immersive reader uh, project that I've got. And I'm gonna go cancel that. Let's just get that open there. Hold on, file and open recent and more. And let's go to immersive reader here. And I've got the immersive reader samples that we've got here. Uh, quick start, and I've written it in Java because I am a Java developer. And you see here that the immersive reader, I'm gonna read this uh, web, web page that I've got in JSP, and it's gonna say there, um, immersive reader is a tool that implements proven technology. And I've got this immersive reader running in the background on Azure Cognitive Services. So all I have to do is go Maven Tomcat 7 colon run, because it's a Tomcat server. And it's gonna okay. actually- I'm, I'm right? sorry, we can't see your screen. We're ah. still uh, on the- okay. let's yeah, let's go uh, stop yeah. screen. Let's go share screen, share screen, and let's go back there. So just okay, great. No. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> let's go back, and you should be able to see my uh, code there. So this is the immersive reader, um, actual cognitive services, and I've got my token that uh, it it gets the the token and it runs there. Now I can actually go into localhost port uh, 88, um, 8888. Uh, local host, and this is running, and I've coded this. You can see there about immersive reader, and this is a button that clicks on it, and it will click through to the Azure Cognitive Services running on my account, and uh, it's about three cents per million transaction. That's how cheap it is, and this is running, and you can incorporate this in your uh, your development uh, process. As you can see there, I've just got uh, a, a index of JSP, and it allows you to uh, code in your services as part um, of your um, everyday uh, process. And that's really the, the, the demos I wanna show you. One is I showed you how to use um, in accessibility insights to get a view to file GitHub issues. Two is that I showed you how to uh, use um, all of the, the tooling, the AI tooling and DevOps to get started. And uh, now I've got a, another challenge of you. I wanna show you how to um, conclude and important is empathy. We looked at how to pop the empathy bubble. We looked at also on how to create persona spectrums and to drive uh, awareness of that. We also looked at ship left and how to incorporate it with accessibility in your DevOps pipeline and then how to automate with AI. Now, there's only one link I wanna give you around how to get started, microsoft.com forward slash accessibility. It has everything in there. It has the AI demos, it has the caption bot, it has the uh, accessibility insights. So if you go to microsoft.com forward slash accessibility, that's all you need to do to get yourself started on this journey. Thank you so much and uh, let's take some questions. I look forward to answering some questions. Hi, Rory. So thanks so much for your talk. Uh, that was really interesting and uh, and I learned a lot uh, personally. <laughs> so uh, first question, um, you, you talked about uh, captioning. What about uh, live captioning for events such as uh, today, for example, or in general for all the for all the people who like to to take part uh, in the public speaking area? Uh, how can we do live captioning uh, with the with the technology nowadays, and uh, what's the benefits of it? So there's two ways to get live captioning. One is this PowerPoint presentation right now. I could have switched on live captioning. And that does a, a very, uh, it's a simpler way, but it, it does a, an, a mechanism. Now, all of the presentation tooling that we have allows you to do live captioning with Microsoft Office. The second one is something that we do uh, called language understanding and also voice training. And that's an Azure Cognitive Service. And what that allows you to do, the AI learns your voice and your nuances. Like I'm South African, so we have a very heavy accent sometimes. Um, but it learns your nuances and you can train it. And that way that you, when you caption, you'll get to your audience exactly like you want them to. And you can train it around that. You can also do multiple speaker training um, on the, um, and let me show you uh, quickly how to get started with that. Uh, let's go to Chrome. Uh, so you can go there and you can go um, to Azure Cognitive Services and Text. Analytics. 
So that's the, the, the one, so text analytics, and you can do uh, captioning around that, cognitive services. So there's uh, a way to actually do that uh, with AR, but you can also go into PowerPoint uh, via the uh, PowerPoint here. Um, let me get out of that presentation. Oh, let's go back there. And uh, we wanna go exit that slideshow. And then you can go to slideshow here, and then you can go always use subtitles. And the subtitles will switch on. It will use uh, your AI here. You can see the spoken language, the bottom, and uh, it will read your microphone. And it learns about your, your speaking style, enabling you to speak to any audience. I've done this in, in front of thousands of people, and it will change and learn. Now, each person who has a Microsoft Office subscription gets to have this for free. And you get up to a million uh, minutes usage for uh, this in your office subscription. And it's built into the entire experience. OK. okay. Uh, well, thanks. Um, uh, what about, uh, so still in the, in the public speaking uh, way, uh, so here I'm a French person. You can hear it <laughs> with my accent too. Um, but how, uh, as a French uh, woman, can I be accessible when I deliver a, a speech uh, in French or in, other, in another language? Okay, so the, the easiest way to do that also is when you use these subtitles, you have a translation service. So I've spoken um, not in French, but in Portuguese, in Arabic, and you can do the live captioning in multiple languages. So you can switch on uh, captioning. I'll show you here, rehearse timings, setup slideshow. Uh, let's go always use subtitles, subtitle settings here. And now we can go uh, spoken language, um, that uh, subtitle language. Let's see, and I'm going to go into French, and I'm going to start uh, my uh, subtitles, and I want to go uh, play from as current view, and you can see that it's going to do start subtitles, and I'm going to go, hello, hi, how are you doing? You can speak to any audience in the world. Obviously, it needs some nuances around changing it, and it will learn as it progresses through that, but now I made my PowerPoint presentation, accessible and it's using Azure Cognitive Services in the background. Now you can speak to any audience. I can speak in Arabic if I had to. Okay, so what you're saying that is that for um, uh, to help the accessibility in Microsoft Office, we need to speak <laughs> to our PowerPoint presentation so that the AI can learn, right? <laughs> yes, the PowerPoint, I'm, I'm selling PowerPoint very well here, but also you can use Azure Cognitive Services. So this is using an Azure Cognitive Services in the background. So you can plug this into any application um, and learn and, and also use it if you just want to do outside uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Well, we we won't miss to 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 do it in the future. Uh, so, do you have any any last tip to to give to the audience that is here today? I would love to see them tweet around the caption bot. Um, so, if you go to uh, caption bot, let's go there again. Uh, do, do, do. Let's get out of here. So that would be a caption bot here. I would love for them to try and uh, uh, and trick the spot um, and see. So if we upload a photo here um, of uh, me, let's see if, uh, if it actually works out who I am. And this is me after a really rough night um, and not getting enough sleep. Let's see what it actually says here. Analyzing image here of rough night uh, Rory. Uh, and uh, it's a man with glasses. Yeah, so it kind of picked up my glasses. I have a look at the caption bot, have some fun with the tweet around me. And the nice thing is that when you go, how did I do five stars, you, you're training the AI model. I don't know if you were aware of that, that that's a great way and you, you help people with accessibility requirements around that. So um, yeah, microsoft.com forward slash accessibility. Um, and then you can kind of uh, also play around with the caption bot. Thank you, Rory. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and uh, I'll let you answer uh, if uh, people have uh, other questions. Thanks. Thanks, Alexia. Cheers, everyone.
Hi, Juanjo. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the conference. <laughs> yes, it's it's the first uh, it's the first time that we're doing this conference, and we're really happy to have a senior software engineer and Microsoft Accessibility MVP. So you've been fighting for this for a while, right? Well, for a few years, for 2007, more or less. I started to to develop software for for blind people to to break barriers all these kind of things so yeah a lot of years i think yeah, <laughs> i feel we old yeah uh, well and and you're in barcelona yes i'm living here in barcelona right now wonderful wonderful so we have people coming from all over it's great oh it's great um well you have about like 40 45 minutes and if people want to ask questions in a chat section we'll be there to answer them so yeah, sure. you, your time is up and it's up to you to give us this wonderful session. Thank you so much, Juanjo. Thank you so much to you. Hello, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this conference, the Accessibility Conf. It's a really pleasure to be here today. So, well, uh, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Juanjo Montiel. I'm a software engineer. Right now, I'm working in Travelport. Uh, but also I'm working as a freelancer, uh, as accessibility consultant. So, well, um, I'm, I have these two profiles, the software developer and also accessibility uh, consultant. So, well, I can create accessible product. I can show other people, teach other people how to create, how to make accessible products. And also I love to play with different things, with the technology. I'm playing with this technology uh, thanks to a friend of mine, Pablo Núñez, who is working in Microsoft, and he said to me, hey, Juanjo, uh, do you think that we could create any kind of uh, functional test that works with the screen readers? So I I took the challenge, and here we are with this, with this speech. So, well, uh, you know, being blind, the accessibility is very, very, very important for, for us because, you know, uh, if I don't create, if I don't make accessible product, I couldn't use uh, them myself. So it's very, very important. And well, uh, I, I want to start uh, telling you a little story. A few years ago, I started to work with a customer that uh, was creating uh, his own uh, product. So they started to, to develop this product and they decided to make it accessible from scratch. So they hired a bunch of consultants and we did it. Uh, we helped them to make it accessible. Well, they released the product and the product was incredible. It was a very, very interesting product, a very powerful and, and useful product for everybody because they kept in mind the accessibility. So a lot of people I gave them a very, very positive feedback with the product. Everybody was very glad. Oh, this product is, is amazing. This product is wonderful. I can use it. So, well, um, but the time passed and they decide uh, two years after, I think more or less, they decide to redesign the UI and even they decide to create a new UI with a new technology. Okay, so well, they started to do all the changes and finally they did the second release with the second version of the product. And what happened? So a lot of people were complaining and were complained because they said to the developers, to the company, hey, this product was accessible, but was no longer. What happened? Why uh, did you do that? So they were not able to understand what happened, but the reality, the real thing is that they uh, committed two errors. The first one is that they didn't bother to, to train their own employees. So they hired a bunch of consultants and we were working uh, with them to, to, to fix all the error, to guide them in the process, but they didn't do any kind of training with their developers, with their employees. So when they decide to redesign the UI, they were not able to remember what thing they should uh, keep in mind to continue the accessibility in their product. So at the end, 
they were not able to keep accessibility and it was a disaster. The second error, it was that they uh, didn't create any kind of accessibility test, any kind of regression test regarding accessibility. So, um, well, the first point, the, the training, I cannot cover in this session, <laughs> but at least we are covering, we are covering the, the second part, the accessibility test, the functional test with uh, accessibility, regarding accessibility. Okay, so for this, um, for this uh, issue, uh, I'm going to use two tools. The first one is Axe, Axe Core. Axe Core is a product, a very, very powerful product developed by uh, Dick System. Dick System is a very known company which developed this, uh, this Axe with several flavors. Uh, they have the Axe Core, the React Axe, uh, Axe for Angular, I think so. I think that they have also for Angular. Axe Cli, I love that because it's an Axe uh, tool uh, that can be um, can be performed uh, by using the, the, the command line. So, well, all these products have a purpose, which is make accessibility tests against a page or a component. So, um, I, well, I'm, I'm developing with .NET language, with .NET uh, ecosystem, and then I'm working with .NET Core, with C Sharp. So I encounter a package called Selenium Axe. Selenium is a web driver. It's a system which allows us to use a browser to uh, conduct tests. Uh, we can open the browser, we can navigate at a specific URL, and we can get HTML elements and do several things with them. We can press button, we can open text edits and, and write on, on, on them. So in this case, we are putting together Selenium and Axe Core. Axe Core is a JavaScript file with all the rules that Axe can check against accessibility. For example, it has a rule to check if the, the, the images has, uh, have alter, alternative text or not. They can perform tests to see if the web pages has a header and heading of level one, if, I don't know, if the forms uh, have uh, labels, or labels or not, all these kind of things. So with Selenium Axe, we can get an HTML body, for example, and perform an analysis uh, against this entire body and check if this, uh, this document has accessibility problems or not. Okay, so uh, with this uh, Selenium Axe, I create, well, first of all, I'm going to show you the first project. This is a demo site. Demo site is a very small, um, a very stupid <laughs> website. Uh, let's go, let's, let's compile and, and run. Hey, what happened? But well, let's try to do with this demo site, debug, start new instance. Maybe I didn't have the startup project. Now, yes, okay. So this site is developed with the MVC pattern with the .NET Core as as as, as .NET Core. Okay, so this home page we have the privacy, well, home, privacy, privacy, sorry, uh, contact, and WCAG criterias. As you can see, my English is not very good, but I am trying to explain explain myself <laughs> as well as possible. Sorry for the, for the subtitlers. Maybe you can encounter some problems subtitling my session. Apologize in advance, <laughs> guys, sorry. Well, okay, so we have this site, and this site is the site that we are going to, to test, okay? So, in the in the Visual Studio, which is the environment that I use to develop, oh, sorry. Okay, so I have this demo site test, okay? And here we have accessibility tests. And this, in this accessibility test, I have several text, uh, test methods. So I have this one, test analyze index. So it's so simple. I get the URL, it's hard code here. We could create any kind of contact, con constant or what, but this is a test. Okay, so we say, okay, uh, we navigate through this URL 
And then we say, okay, give me the result. The result of what driver analyze. Analyze what? So the entire document. And then I say, okay, well, uh, a, a test to check that the result is not null. And then we say, I want to make sure that the number of violations of this page is equal to zero. Okay? If uh, Axe Core encounter one or more violations, this test will fail. So uh, let's do that. Let's try to execute. Okay? I'm going to stop the, the current ex execution. I can put here a breakpoint. So when the test starts executing, uh, the execution will stop here. Yes, exactly, here. And let's execute the test by pressing uh, Control R, Control T. Okay, it's starting. It's start Firefox, also the web page in the background. Firefox X is here. It's very, very interesting because we can control all Firefox behavior uh, with .NET. Okay, so I get the URL. We navigate through this URL. So in Firefox, we can see here the page is loaded. And now I perform the analysis. It takes a few seconds. Okay. And here we can see if we inspect the variables and we expand the results, we can see violations, zero violations. Our site pass all the access core checks. Does it imply that we don't have any accessibility problem? Not at all. <laughs> okay, you know, uh, by using accessibility automate uh, tools, we can discover up to 50% of the problems. But anyway, you have to do a lot of manual tests to make sure that your site is entirely accessible, okay? Because there is things, there are things that we cannot cover. For example, if we put a wrong uh, alt uh, description in an image, the, the alternative, uh, sorry, the automate tool is not able to, to, to figure out that because it does not understand the natural language and does not understand the image. We could do something with, uh, you know, uh, computer vision and so on, but <laughs> it's not covered <laughs> in this in this session. Okay, so you say, oh, perfect, we have we have this test. We also have another test for other pages. For example, we have another test for contact. We could duplicate that for private uh, for privacy policy, for example is something very, very, very easy. Basically, we can copy this method. We can collapse. As you can see, I'm using the keyboard for everything because I can't use the mouse. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, Visual Studio has a very, very powerful keyboard system. Um, shortcut system, sorry. So let's paste the method. Let's change the name. Let's analyze privacy. And now in the URL, we change the home, the contact, sorry, by privacy. And this, uh, the, 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 the rest of the method is exactly the same. In fact, we could extract the method and pass a URL and check. We could do uh, a lot of refactor here. But for now, let's do as it is. OK, so let's try to compile. And let's execute that breakpoint here and execute. Okay, we navigate to the privacy. We are here, we analyze. And the results say that violation equal to zero. Okay, that's perfect. Now we're going to do 
a change. Okay, imagine I am the junior in the office and my boss asked me to create, to, to, to make a change in the privacy policy uh, page. So I open the page, I open the view, sorry, here, views, home, privacy. And here, for example, I don't know, I can put here, uh, well, no, we can, no, let, let's do with the contact. This is, okay, let's open the contact. We have here a form with a label. Name, so I decide, by myself, I decide to remove this label because I don't like the label. Goodbye label. So I save that, I compile, I build the project. <clears throat> eh, failed? Why? Ah, okay, because we have something. Ah, we have the site open here, okay. Let's try to close everything. Let's try to compile now everything again. Okay, that's it. Okay, so now we are going to push these changes in the repository. Okay, well, first of all, we can, we can see the result of this <laughs> bad change, okay. So if we navigate at contact page, hey, why it say name? If I remove the page, the, the label, what happened here? Okay, views, home, contact, input. I don't know why. Let's perform a clean solution just in case. And let's rebuild. Let's remove whatever instance. And let's try to execute again. Okay. Okay, now the name does not have any label. So the screen reader read, uh, read edit, only edit. So we just create a new accessibility barrier here. Okay, so now I'm going to push this to the repository, okay? Get status, we have this fail modify. Okay, so git add, git checkout, uh, dash b to create the branch. Feature slash um, new uh, issue. Oi, I, I, I mistake with the name. I have an error with the name uh, git branch, feature para new issue. Status. Okay, so git push, we have to copy the entire, entire command, we paste, and we are uh, pushing the new branch to the repository, okay? So now I'm going to open the repository in which I have uh, my, my, my code hosted, and here you can see, let's say, Oh, what happened here? Uh, oh, okay. I didn't add the files and the commits. <laughs> and I'm stupid. Git add, git commit. I add a new accessibility issue. Now, yes, git push. Okay. Okay, that's perfect. And now if I refresh this page, you updated, feature new issue. So create a pull request. A pull request is 
um, a, a request of uh, to put new changes in a specific branch. In this case, I want to match my changes in the main branch. So the title, this is this one, and exactly, I say I want to put the feature in main branch. Okay, so create. But I have a branch policy. This branch policy is that before merging my changes in the main branch, I need to pass a CI build. A CI build is a build that should be completed, should be successful before merging. So the build is, is executing right now in the background, in the Azure DevOps system, okay? This is a CI process that uh, I, I follow to make sure that never, never an accessibility issue can um, uh, reach the main branch. So as you can see, the CI is in progress. So in the CI build, we are executing all the tests that we have in place, the tests that you saw before. So in the meantime, we can execute the test locally. So for example, if I go to demo site test, I open the accessibility test and I find the analyze contact, I put a breakpoint here and I execute the test. Okay, Firefox is open. We navigate through uh, to the uh, at the URL, and now we perform the analysis. Okay, what does the result say? So the result says violations. One violation, oh no, my God. So the violation is description. Ensure every form element has a label. Okay, we remove the label. So this rule uh, uh, is, is, uh, is failing because of this. So the test will fail. Is I continue with this, this violation equals zero will fail. You can see here, and you can see in the test, in the test explorer, that this test the contact failed. Okay, so we can check now in our pull request. That the CI failed too. Okay, so we cannot complete this pull request until the the bill is success. So we need to fix this error to get get it. So let's go to the to the contact page again. Uh, so here label for name name. Okay. Okay, that's all. Compile. Let's execute just in case. Contact. And the screen reader says name because we put the label in place again so let uh, push the new changes so git add star git commit i revert my label removal git push and now in the pull request automatically you can see that the CI build is running again. In progress. Okay, so if we did it correctly, the CI build should um, 
should be successful, and we could complete the, the pull request. Indeed, we can press here, set autocomplete, and say, okay, set autocomplete. And when the pull request, sorry, when the build is success, automatically the pull request will be completed and the changes will be merged into main branch. Okay, so this is one of the tools that I want to show you today. The second tool is a tool that I developed uh, two years ago, which is NVDA testing driver, which is NVDA testing driver. So, so this is a driver to manage NVDA. NVDA is a screen reader. I'm sure that you know NVDA is an open source screen reader. So uh, with this driver, as we did before with Selenium, we are able to control NVDA, not only control, but also read what NVDA pronouns. So we can get the pronunciation of whatever thing in NVDA, get the text in our .NET program, and compare with whatever thing uh, that we expect. So for example, well, uh, it's better to, to do an an uh, live experiment. <laughs> okay, so, okay, we can see that the build has successful and the pull request has been completed. So now if I go to main and I do git pull, we can see that we have our changes merged. If we do git log, in the log we can see this line merged PR27, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's all. Okay, so now we are going to do the NVDA uh, test. Okay, first of all, I have, I have um, a project ready. So let's put in, inside this, this solution. So the project is here. Demo site screen reader. So we paste here. And now, it's copying. Okay, now I open the solution and I say okay add existing project okay okay so well um, the, the idea behind uh, this project is imagine let's open the demo site again Okay. Okay, and let's go to the contact page. Now I'm going to open NVDA instead of JAWS. That is the screen reader that I am I'm using right now. NVDA. Desktop list. Contact demo site personal micro. Okay, so now ben uh, I'm in the in the headers of the page. Main link contact by phone collapsed link heading it's a level three. Contact by phone collapse. So I can press enter. Expanded and expanded. Expand. Press enter again. Collapse and collapse. Okay, so for example, with my test, I could open this page, ask NVDA what it says when uh, it is in uh, on this heading and compare with I expect to be pronounced by NVDA. So to, to achieve that, uh, I use a tool called a voice viewer. It's, it's in here in the NVDA menu, NVD in the tools. Remote sub menu, view lock, speech viewer. Speech S. viewer, okay. Contact demo. So with this speech viewer, NVDA shows speech here, viewer on start, edit, re contact, when I go to the, to the header, uh, to the header, sorry. Contact by phone. Contact by phone. Heading. So shows here in the viewer, edit, we can see this one. Contact by phone collapsed link heading. So we could copy contact. this one to a notepad, for example. Untitled. Paste that and use it to make the test. Okay, so NVDA speech viewer row one column two. Let's close NVDA. Exit NVDA. 
I use JAWS, uh, JAWS because uh, JAWS works very well with, with Visual Studio. NVDA does not work uh, with Visual Studio as I need. Okay, so let's analyze the project, the NVDA project. Okay, so we have here, for example, the contact should test. Check content header collapsible panels. Okay, so when the system uh, reaches this point, this, this test, we have an, an initializer with open NVDA and then I can control inside this test. So what I do, what I do is, okay, I put the, the window in the foreground because if not, NVDA is, in, is not able to, to read it. And then when I get the URL, well, let me, maybe the test explorer is in front. So now you can, you can see the code. So we navigate to the URL, we focus on the window to make sure that NVDA is able to, to, to read it. Okay, we go to the beginning of the page, sending control home. So as you can see, we are controlling NVDA from this, this line and we are saying, hey, go to the beginning of the, of the document. And now we say, okay, send command and get spoken text. And the command is Browse mode next heading three. So NVDA will go to the first heading level three, and in this variable we will have the text, and then we compare the text against the, what we copy before in the notepad, which is contact by phone collapse lean heading level three. So let's execute the test. Okay, well we go, we go to the next heading and we compare with the different uh, heading text. So if something fail, if something is not pronounced as expected, the test will fail. Okay, so imagine that, for example, we are remove the area expanded from the heading. So the next uh, time that we execute the text and the test, as NVDA only will say, uh, contact by phone, heading level three, the test will fail. Okay, so let's try to execute. Okay, I I go to remove all the all the breakpoints. I uh, uh, Unload uh, JAWS, unload JAWS, and I'm going to execute the test. I unload JAWS, uh, JAWS because uh, if we have opened two screen readers, uh, they intercept each other, so we would encounter problems. Okay, let's execute it. NVDA started. Hey, running. Microsoft Visual Studio window, Test Explorer window, Tracking List View Table, Connected to Control Server, Mozilla Firefox Busy. Open About Firefox. Blank. Open the page. As you can see, NVDA is working alone. It's working Mozilla completely Firefox. alone. Being controlled by .NET Engine. Busy. Contact demo site. Banner landmark navigation line. Heading level one, main landmark, contact by email, postal address, fill the contact form, collapse link, heading level three. A11 Y tests. Okay, running. that's all. Microsoft Visual it Studio goes window. through all the heading, tracking comparing the text, and NVDA is stopped automatically. Okay, so let's open JAWS, uh, JAWS again. Oh, my time is almost over. Okay, I'm in a hurry right now. <laughs> okay, so I see the test and it say screen reader test passed. So, what is here? Contact shoot, and this one, the header is uh, has passed. Okay. So now, imagine that we go to the demo site again 
and we go to home to contact we find phone and we have here the header to collapse that target and we remove this one area expanded to false we remove that so now this is a normal heading without any kind of area to say that the heading could be collapsed and expanded okay so now we rebuild the project let's execute the demo sites and let's see what NVDA says let's open NVDA as you can see my NVDA instance has a voice and the, the NVDA that's the test engine open is an, has another voice because there are uh, two different instances the NVDA test open and portable instance and when it's closed it removed the instance so it's a completely uh, portable instance okay so I go to contact and here it say contact by phone link heading level 3 but it does not say collapse okay so now we are we are going to execute the test okay so let's open Joe's okay let's go to the test contact shoot and let's execute the test again A11 white tests, running, Microsoft Visual Studio window, tab control, contact you.cs tab selected one of three, text editor edit, connected to Mozilla Firefox busy, about blank. Okay, first we open, it's Mozilla not Firefox. Busy. Contact demo site. Banner landmark navigation okay. line. Heading level one. Let's Main see. landmark contact by phone link. Heading oh, level three. Contact by phone. And it stopped because A11 it said no, no, no. Microsoft Visual Studio. That, knows, that's, that not much. So I stopped the test and I marked the test as fail. I'm going to, to, to check it. Okay, so it did it say that fail, so let's copy the details. Let's open notepad. So it say result. Result message. Expected. Contact by phone, collapse, link, heading level three. NVDA says contact by phone, link, heading level three. So as it not says the collapse word, the, te the test does not pass. Okay, so we can do another test, for example, with a tree view. A tree view is a non-standard uh, HTML control, so we put a lot of area to uh, get it. So we have this test, to your accessible shoot. As, as you can see inside the test, we have a lot of interaction. So we go to the test, to the to the tree view. We send a uh, right arrow, and we check if it's say expanded. A lot of different operation to check that the tree view work properly. So we can execute the test. So. We can also, as we did Microsoft before, put this test inside an integration, integration process, a continuous integration. So if the test does not pass, the pull request won't be approved.
Mozilla Firefox. We are in the page. Busy. Tree view example demo site. Banner landmark and navigation landmark and level one link demo site. List with two items link home. And we link privacy out of list. List with four items link home. Link privacy. Link contact. Let's go. All WCH expanded. Level two one one point two one point three one point four level one two expanded. Okay, everything is working fine. That's all. The test is completed and the test is passed because eleven white tests running. The, 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 the preview work as expected. Okay, so. As you can see, we can create manual tests for isolated components. For example, you can do a chat in ARIA and you can, you can check that NVDA is reading the new messages. You can do an autocomplete and you can check that NVDA pronounce as, uh, what it should pronounce, all these kind of things. So in the moment in which unintentionally you create a barrier, for example, as I did before, removing the ARIA expanded, removing whatever attribute that NVDA uh, should pronounce and all these kind of things. With this kind of test, we can uh, realize about this uh, early and fix it before going to production with this kind of error. So with these two tools, with the Axe Core and with NVDA testing driver, we can do a lot of automate tests and make sure that our site keep the accessibility over time. Okay, so well, I think my time is over. <laughs> and well, all I need to say, NVDA testing driver and the Selenium Axe are uh, open source, so NVDA, NVDA testing driver uh, is in my repository. I'm going to put the URL so the, the organizers can put in the, in the video and also the other resources that, that I use to show you all of this, all of this, uh, this session. So, well, guys, thank you so much to, to be here and thank you again to the organizers to allow me to be here today and explain to you all these things about NVDA testing driver and Axecore and all the automated tests. Thank you so much. Bye bye. So yeah, one whole uh, one question that I have for you is, um, do you how how can you see the technology helping people that needs accessibility and needs support? What is the most exciting part about new technology for people that needs accessible products? Well, for me, the technology always uh, has been the, the a, a, a barrier breaker. Yeah. It's like with the technology, uh, I can uh, remove a lot of barriers that I encounter in my day to day. So for people with disability, people that need accessibility product, being able to develop product to their own or for other people with disabilities or use this technology uh, allow us to be fully autonomous in my day to day. I use the technology for everything. I use the technology from move around the city with the GPS. I use the technology to to uh, control the, the the automation in my home in my home to avoid have uh, lights switched on, for example. I, I use the technology to scan documents. I use the technology to see the expiry date of, of, of the food, a lot of things. So for me, everything is excited in the technology for people with disabilities because allow us to do a lot of things that without the technology, we won't be able to do. Yeah, well, I can understand that. And um, well, the following question that I have is, um, do you feel like sometimes the technology within your day to day is up to date? Like it's it's there, but do you see a lag and a lack of knowledge uh, from the people that actually build the technology, such as the developers, the architects, the CIC, the DevOps people yeah. as well? Yeah, sure. The problem is that uh, there, is, there is a very, very important lack of knowledge about accessibility in all the, in, uh, in all the, the situations, I mean, in the universities, for example, at least here in Barcelona or in Spain, we don't have a specific uh, subject about accessibility. In the in in other in other in other um, uh, in bootcamp and so on, they don't have either this kind of subjects. So, it's normal that when you start to develop in a company, you don't have you don't have the knowledge to to build accessible product. This is one of the problem. So, if you don't know how to do that, you won't do that. So we have this we have this problem because nobody is able to to create accessible product because we don't have this train right now.
Thank you so much. No, no, no worries. No worries. <laughs>
Uh, you can see on the left side here those different features that I just spoke about. Um, and this on the right here is an example of what it might look like in one of our partner integrations in Flipgrid, for example. They have some text here and then they have an immersive reader button. So when you click that button, it makes that text on their web page more accessible and easier to read for their users. Uh, and again, all of that information you can find at aka.ms slash immersive reader. Um, and a little bit more about immersive reader is that it was inclusively designed um, to help people of all abilities with their reading, specifically for people with dyslexia, ADHD, emerging readers, non-native speakers, people with visual impairments. Um, and it's currently already used in Microsoft products across the board in Word, in OneNote, in Teams, many different places. And we have about 23 million monthly active users already using it. Um, and that includes in Microsoft products, but also it's now immersive reader is now generally available uh, as a Microsoft cognitive service so that third party developers like you can uh, integrate it into their own apps. So, and that was opened in October of this past year. So now it's available for um, anyone to integrate into their own apps. And I'll be talking a little bit about how you can do that. And so some more reasons of why you might want to use Immersive Reader. Um, if you're concerned about inclusion and equity, if you're looking to be compliant with accessibility laws, uh, if you're looking for something that has a low cost and an easy um, engineering entry, um, those are all great reasons for why you might want to look into incorporating Immersive Reader into your apps. Um, some feedback that we've had from our customers, which I have experienced firsthand uh, when it was still safe to go to conferences because of COVID, um, of people that are really moved by this technology. Um, there's a quote here. I just wanted to let you know that today a mom spoke to me and she started crying. Her son was finally able to read on his own thanks to Immersive Reader. I'm currently changing the lives of so many children through that software. So. It's a really powerful tool, and I'm hopefully going to show you how easy it is to incorporate it into your own web apps. Um, here's a little bit more, uh, if you're still not sold, um, uh, awards that Immersive Reader has won, um, including an innovation practice award. And there's also studies that have been done that, that show uh, improved reading and writing outcomes from students that have been using Immersive Reader. So, um, there is, there are studies as well to back this technology up. And here are some examples of third party partners that have already integrated Immersive Reader. Uh, we have Wonderopolis, Pear Deck, Canvas, uh, My Day, all sorts of different uh, partners who have seen the benefits of Immersive Reader and have integrated it into their own apps. Uh, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can uh, incorporate Immersive Reader into your own apps now. Uh, and again, all of this information you can find at aka.ms slash Immersive Reader. Um, and it, Immersive Reader has become generally available through Microsoft Cognitive Services this past October. And the pricing for it is that if you're sending less than 3 million characters per month to us, that it's free. So if, if you're a small app, it's not a price that you have to worry about. Um, after those 3 million per month characters, it's $10 per additional million characters after that. And if you're an ed tech company or you're a large volume customer, there are discounts you can get as well. Um, and our SDK, which I'll be talking a little bit about, uh, lets you incorporate Immersive Reader into web apps, iPad, iPhone, Android, and Windows 10. And we've got all sorts of documentation and engineering walkthrough videos and other resources that will help you do that. And some common questions people might have are, 
Uh, you showed us plain text being able to be sent into immersive reader. What else might you support? Um, if you have uh, math that you want to show in the immersive reader, if it's in the math ML format, that would work. If you have just HTML you want to send in, as long as it doesn't have images or tables, that will work. Um, we are working on image and PDF support currently, but um, basically any sort of text content that you want to send in is something that we will support. Um, and so I did want to now take you through a little bit of our documentation, show it to, in action. Um, and just, I'm going to keep reiterating these three points about the, the three things you need in order to incorporate immersive reader into your own apps. The first thing you need is an Azure account. The second thing you need is an immersive reader resource in that Azure account. And the third thing is to use our immersive reader SDK, our JavaScript library, um, to incorporate it into your apps. And we have documentation and videos and all of that um, available. So, and again, aka.ms slash immersive reader is the place to go. So I'll go there right now. Um, it just takes you to this page right here. And I'm gonna click at the top. I'm gonna click on documentation. It's gonna take me down to the documentation section of the um, page. And so I'm going to click first on Immersive Reader SDK. I'm going to check it out. And so this SDK is open source on GitHub, which does mean that it's open for people to make contributions to. So if there are, um, is, if there's something you would like to contribute, we definitely welcome that. We've got issues open. Um, we're an active community, and we would definitely encourage that. Um, this GitHub is also the place where all of our quick start guides live. So if there's ever an update you want to make to that to make it easier for other people to get started with Immersive Reader, that would be awesome as well. Um, so I'm actually going to click into the JS folder here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic building blocks that you need um, to incorporate Immersive Reader. And um, there really isn't too many steps. Uh, the first thing that you're going to need, as I mentioned earlier, is that you need an immersive reader resource in Azure. Um, and we have all sorts of instructions and guides and videos on how to do that. But for the purposes of this lightning talk, I'm going to assume that you've already done that. And once you have that resource set up, uh, really the only chunks of things you're going to need to do are to somehow get our JavaScript library, whether that's through a script tag that you put in your HTML, or if you're an NPM or a Yarn user, you can add our node package, uh, our immersive reader package, uh, and then you'll have our immersive reader JavaScript. Um, and then the other basic thing you're going to need is some way to launch the immersive reader, which is generally a button that a user will click. Um, because it will launch something in full screen. So you want to make sure that it's something the user actually wants to do. Um, and then when that button or event is fired, um, all you're going to need to do is call this launch async method from our immersive reader SDK. Um, and the launch async method takes a token, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, the subdomain, um, which is which will come from setting up your immersive reader resource in Azure, and then the content that you want to send into the immersive reader, as well as any options that you want. That's a fourth parameter. Um, and those really are the only pieces that you need in order to launch immersive readers. You need that Azure resource, you need our SDK, uh, our, our library, you need some way to launch the immersive reader, and you need that launch to call the immersive reader dot launch async. And that's really all you have to do. So um, I'm going to additionally, I'm going to go back now to back to aka.ms slash immersive reader. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit more of an in depth view uh, into one of our quick starts. So that was an overview of what you might need to do. And then I'll go a little bit more into detail and show you some of our documentation. 
So I'm going to click on this Get Started Read Our Documentation link. And you can see here it's taken us to a docs.microsoft.com page. And there are a few different types of documentation that we have that lives here. Um, we have some overviews and some short getting started engineering videos. We've got some how-to guides that are go into a little bit more depth about the different options that you can send into the immersive reader. There's a link to the JavaScript SDK on GitHub, which I was just showing you. And then there's a few different quick starts listed here in different platforms. So if you're um, building something with C Sharp in ASP.NET Core, or if you're building an iOS or an Android application, um, or if you're building a web app, um, we have quick starts for all of those different languages. Here's my cat. Um, so we have quick starts available for all of those different languages. And so I'm going to be showing you the Node.js quick start. And you can see here that those different language options are available as well. Um, and it's going to list again those prerequisites. Uh, the first one being that you have that immersive reader resource created in Azure um, and that you have um, those steps will take you through creating that resource and then you'll eventually be left at the end of those steps with these four pieces of information that you'll need to keep moving forward. You'll have a tenant ID, a client ID, a client secret, and a subdomain. And all four of those things you'll have already acquired by the end of going through the guide for how to create that immersive reader resource. And those four things are secret, so they're not going to want to be something that you put uh, in the plain text of your code. Um, and so in this quick start, for example, they're using the .env node package to uh, hide those values behind a config file. Um, so that's just one example of how you might do this if you're building a Node.js application. Um, another thing we recommend is that you put some sort of authentication in front of um, immersive reader so that you don't um, so that you prevent unauthorized users from obtaining tokens to use against your immersive reader resource. Um, so basically you just don't want anybody to be able to go and open immersive reader and send in millions of characters and drive your Azure bill up. Um, but that's definitely up to you, um, but it's what we recommend. And so one way of potentially doing that is to use OAuth um, to get some tokens. And in this quick start, we're specifically using an express router to um, set up this new endpoint, which, will, which is called get token and subdomain. And it makes a call to this OAuth endpoint to get a token. Um, and you can see here it's passing in some of those secrets that we had set up in the config file. Um, and it returns a token and subdomain. So um, that's one thing you might want to set up is that authentication layer. Um, and then this next part of the quick start is the actual HTML of the app. And um, you can see here again that there is this script tag here that pulls in the immersive reader SDK. And so again, um, if the script tag directly isn't what you want to do, you can always use NPM or Yarn to install our, our SDK package as well. Um, and then you can see in the body of the HTML that there is content that we're going to want to send into the immersive reader. And there is an immersive reader button. And that immersive reader button, you can see in the JavaScript that's on the page, um, when it's clicked, we want to call handle launch immersive reader. And if you look at what handle launch immersive reader does, it calls that get token and subdomain function, which makes the call to that endpoint that we had set up, which will return uh, the token and subdomain um, once it has confirmed that it's from an authenticated user. And once we get that token, then um, we can 
start building the different things we want to pass into that immersive reader launch async method that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so that token that we had just gotten, we pass in the subdomain that we just got, we pass in the data. So the actual title of the immersive reader view and the actual data or the content that you want to send in and then the options and um, one of the many options you can send in is an exit callback. So if you want a specific method to run as soon as the user closes Immersive Reader, we can make sure that happens. Um, but we have a bunch of um, additional documentation on the left side here of the different options and things you can pass in to Immersive Reader. Um, but basically, those are the, the building blocks of what you need in order to run immersive readers. So you need that Azure resource, you need um, some sort of way to, if you prefer, some sort of authentication um, in order to get a token, and then you just need our immersive reader SDK um, in order to call immersive reader .launch async. And those are really the only pieces you need um, to start making your app more accessible for all of your users. And so I just um, wanted to end with, um, if you have any questions, you can use the immersive reader tag on Stack Overflow. It is a tag that our engineering team looks at very frequently. Um, if you have any questions, you can always use that or you can reach out to me on Twitter. Again, I'm on Twitter at tessalin underscore n. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Yeah. Um, Thanks for, for this presentation. Uh, so I have a few questions. Um, how did you get the idea, uh, the first idea of the immersive reader uh, within your team? Do you know, do you know where it comes from? Yeah, so there's actually a really cool story behind the immersive reader. Uh, Microsoft as a whole company started doing hackathons as a company for an entire week, normally in the summer for anyone to join, whether you're an engineer or a designer or a PM or anyone else. Um, and so the idea of creating something new at, in a hackathon um, was, sorry, can I restart that? Yeah. Um, so the idea behind Immersive Reader was actually a really cool story. Microsoft as a company started doing company-wide hackathons for a week in the summer a few years ago. And the one of the winning projects actually for that hackathon ended up being Immersive Reader. So Mike Tolfson, who is the program product manager for Immersive Reader, actually created this hackathon project and he wanted some sort of solution to help people that might have trouble reading, so people with dyslexia, ADHD, etc., um, and came up with this initial idea for Immersive Reader. It ended up winning the entire hackathon and um, was such a cool idea that it eventually became a real product. And now we have entire engineering teams, um, including me, working on Immersive Reader. So it was really um, built around the idea of accessibility and it has grown to be so much more than that since. Okay, well, that's, that's a real, <laughs> real yeah, nice story. Yeah, really cool. <laughs> um, the second one, and then I'm going to, to let the, the people ask you uh, their questions. Uh, my second question was about the language. Uh, so you show that there were um, several languages uh, to, to, to include Immersive Reader. Do you know the language uh, now that is the most used to integrate uh, Immersive Reader? I'm not 100% sure what the most popular is, but I'm assuming it's our, our Node.js, our JavaScript uh, people that have web apps. Um, so the other ones, the Android and the iOS, um, I'm assuming have less people because the web apps you can use cross-platform and all sorts of different things. But um, all of them are there, they're available for you to contribute to, it's all open source. So if there's another platform that you would want to add, um, we would love for you to contribute to that as well. 
well, the message is sent <laughs> for the people uh, uh, hearing here today. Uh, so thanks a lot, Tessa, for your contribution for uh, this um, this really great talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, thanks for being here today and uh, have a really nice day. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Here we go. Hi, Fernanda. Hey, Olivier. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> good, me too. So we are very happy to have you, Fernanda. So you work as a PM in the Accessibility Insight uh, team. Yep. And it may not be obvious when you see your background, but you love gardening. But you told me that you're not good when it's inside uh, plants, right? Okay, yeah. that, I don't see any plants behind you. <laughs> nope, inside they all die. Outside my garden is beautiful. I'll have to show it to you one day. Okay, so next time we do a conference, we do it outside, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Fernanda, you're going to talk about accessibility inside, obviously. And so I'll leave you to your talk and see you after. Awesome, thank you. Hello, everyone. We are very happy to be here. Today, you will learn how to use Accessibility Insights and how you can find and fix accessibility issues before they make it to the hands of your users. My name is Fernanda Bonin, and I am a Program Manager in the Accessibility Insights team. Now, we all know how important it is to deliver accessible products, but you might be wondering, why do every developer needs to think about accessibility? And why is there something called Accessibility Insights to help me with it? Well, let me tell you about the day I wanted to put together a bike stand. In my screen, I am showing a picture of a very simple bike stand and a bike, and then one of just a bike stand. It's very simple, nothing fancy. So I opened it and I decided to put it together without instructions, because come on, who looks at the instructions sometimes? First try, I end up with extra screws somehow, and the bike didn't stand. And so for the second try, I decided to check the instructions, except there were none. Uh, the instructions were just two images and not very descriptive ones. So second try was not very successful either. For my third try, I ended up spending time looking for videos and instructions online, looking for an expert who could explain me how to do this. So for this very simple stand, it took me more than one hour to put it together, lots of research, and I ended up very frustrated. And that is what happens when there aren't any good or easy to understand instructions and no expert at hand. Just like that very frustrating bike stand, if accessibility is not considered during the product life cycle, accessibility issues are going to affect the developer productivity and the product quality. If we allow for accessibility issues to be caught at the end by your testers or your customers, that means that developers have to be in this back and forth cycle where they deliver something and then they receive a bunch of issues, they fix those issues, and then they receive yet more bugs. And while this back and forth process is happening, we have unhappy customers that simply cannot use our products. And that is why we created Accessibility Insights. Accessibility Insights is agile. Developers don't need to be accessibility experts in order to find and fix common accessibility issues early in the development process with a simple process that takes five minutes. They are up to date. Our web tool helps you assess against the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA. And we also add ad hoc tools in addition to the manual, assisted, and automated test, we have easy to use tools that have visualizations that can help you catch issues like inspect, tap stops, and color contrast. By introducing accessibility insights in the developer workflow, you can save money and time and help developers ship more accessible products. Developers don't need to be accessibility experts in order to find and fix those common accessibility issues early in the process and deliver more accessible products. 
Accessibility Insights is a suite of free open source tools. We have tools for web, Accessibility Insights for web, that is a Chrome and an Edge extension to test web apps and websites. For Windows, Accessibility Insights for Windows, that helps you test accessibility in Windows application. A sample to integrate your automated checks in the build pipeline, Accessibility Insights for CICD. Our rules engine for Windows, Accessibility Insights for Windows. And hearing our users' feedback, we also have two new offerings we are working on. Accessibility Insights for Android, powered by Axe Android. It has automated accessibility checks for Android applications. And we're working on a GitHub action that integrates the Axe Core automated checks into the GitHub pipeline. Now, let me show you Accessibility Insights for Web and Accessibility Insights for Android. In my screen, I am showing the Accessible University website. It is a website that was created for accessibility issues for demonstration purposes. Very simple website. We have a couple of tabs with a menu, a form, a carousel, and some text and a table at the end. And I already have installed Accessibility Insights for Web in my Edge browser. Now, let's imagine I am a developer and I want to fix these accessibility issues. The first thing I will do is open Accessibility Insights for Web. A pop-up appears and shows me there are three things I can do. The first one is FastPass, a process that's going to help me find common accessibility issues in less than five minutes. The second one is assessment, a guided process for assessing my accessibility compliance against the WCAG 2.1 AA criteria. And finally, I have quick access to the visualizations in my FastPass and assessment with the ad hoc tools. If I am a developer, the first thing I will do is run FastPass. As soon as I select it, the automated checks powered by the queue uh, and Axe Core are open and they highlight there are 24 accessibility issues in my screen. I have the list of failures and I also have them highlighted in my screen. From my list of issues, I can simply expand one of the failures and it's going to tell me the path, the, the snippet and how to fix it. It is not enough we tell you there is an issue. We are also helping you to fix the issue. I can also file a, a bug in GitHub or Azure DevOps. And the thing I really like about this feature is that I only need to select two buttons, one to file the issue, and the other one to save the information. Because all the information I need for this bug, it's automatically pre-populated for me in my Azure DevOps. All I need to do is to assign it to someone and hit save. The other thing I can do is to export a result and an, a self-contained HTML report that's going to give me all the information of this report in a report I can share with my team via email or Teams. Now, I told you five minutes and we haven't used five minutes yet for this, for this test. So the next thing I wanna do is do a tap stops test. Tap stops is a test that's going to help me understand how a user using keyboard only will navigate my page. And this is going to help me catch important accessibility issues like elements not receiving focus, things that don't have a focus indicator, or even a keyboard trap that will make my site very hard to use. As soon as I turn it on and start pressing the tab key, a visualization appears in the screen and it shows me how a user will navigate my screen with their keyboard only. I already see there are a couple of accessibility issues. For example, all these submenus never open whenever they receive focus of the keyboard. And there is a carousel that has some arrow keys, and those also no, don't receive focus when I press tab. I also notice there is no focus indicator. So if I didn't have this helpful visualization, I wouldn't know where my focus and where my keyboard is. 
If I want to go the extra mile, I can use the new needs review test. This test is going to show possible accessibility issues that need to be reviewed and verified by a human. Instead of us telling you how to fix it, we explain to you how to check if this is an accessibility issue or not. And with only five minutes, I was able to catch a lot of common accessibility issues that are going to make very hard for users to navigate my site. Now, let's imagine I have fixed all my issues in FastPass and I am ready to go the next to, through the next step in this accessibility journey. Then I can go to assessment. Assessment is a manual experience in which you're going to navigate through a set of tests and requirements that are assisted and manual. And they are going to explain you how to check against your accessibility compliance. It is not enough that we tell you, hey, your images need to be accessible. We explain to you, why are you doing this test with the getting started information? And then we divide each one of the criteria into different requirements, so it's very easy to test. Each one of the requirements is going to have detail how to test information. Additionally, more information and examples where we explain why it matters, how to fix it, and have examples with a fail and a pass. And where possible, we are also going to be adding a visual helper and a list of instances. So it's very easy for you to, to have all your list of images with all the relevant attributes. In this case, I'm showing the image type, whether they're connected as meaningful or decorative, the area role, and the accessible name. With accessibility insights, there is no reason for you not to check your accessibility. Now, let's jump to a demo of accessibility insights for Android, our newest tool that works in Windows, Mac, and Linux. I am in my Windows computer, and I have my emulator connected to it. I already open Accessibility Insights for Android, and Accessibility Insights for Android automatically detected my emulator and the app I have connected to it. In my emulator, I am showing the Sunflower application. It's a demo application where I introduce some extra accessibility issues. So I'm just going to select Start Testing. Within seconds, the automated checks powered by Accentrate ran, and they highlighted issues in my application with a screenshot. From here, I can expand the rule. For example, this one about an image view name, where I have an image without an alternative text. And it will give me more information about the class name and the how to fix it. If I want to track this issue or share it with my team, once again, I can file an issue in GitHub or Azure DevOps. And if I want to learn more about why this rule is important, I can select the resources for this rule, more information about view name. And this will give me additional information about the rule, why it matters, and how to fix it, once again, with an example of a fail and a pass. Similar to accessibility in Search for Web, we have added a needs review check. And it's going to highlight possible color contrast accessibility issues in your screen. Accessibility insights for Android is very easy to use. Let's imagine I am done with this screen and I want to test another screen. I can simply go back to my emulator and select a different screen and then select the start over again. And just as simple as that, I run my automated checks again. In this case, it's telling me it didn't find accessibility issues with the automated checks. So I need to go through manual testing to continue investigating my accessibility compliance. Now let's go back to the presentation. What can you do? You can keep accessibility in mind in every step of the process. You can download Accessibility Insights at accessibilityinsights.io, and you can follow us on GitHub and Twitter and contribute to our projects.
We hope you feel energized to share this back with your colleagues and that you start using accessibility insights as you develop. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, so before we start closing this session, I had to say something. I love the cat uh, <laughs> with the logo. <laughs> it's just awesome. So thank uh, you. Do you know who has a name? It has a name? Yeah, it's it's called Ada. It's our accessibility developer ambassador. Okay, good to know. I will check that. Um, so also something to say, I'm a huge fan of GitHub Actions, so I'm very happy to see that you're working on that and, and definitely test that on my uh, web applications. Um, we, we have some time left, so I have a, a few questions for you. Um, so how, so you, you've shown the, the, uh, the tools, but how would you recommend uh, developers to use, to actually use accessibility insight? Wow, that's such a good question, and, and we get that question a lot. Uh, the first thing I will recommend is before a pull request, as you are developing, you run FastPass. You don't need to run uh, um, a full assessment or, or to do everything every time you have a small UI change. But just for sanity's sake, before, before putting a pull request, run FastPass and make sure those common accessibility issues don't get into your main Teams branch. The other thing you can do is, just in case someone forgets or someone is not familiar with the process, have uh, automated checks as part of, as your, of your CICD pipeline. And that way, it will help you catch, again, some of those common accessibility issues. And then once your team has completed the feature, let's have everyone huddle together and run an assessment and uh, or in the case of accessibility insights for Android, do more manual accessibility testing. Uh, so you can catch all those accessibility issues. The important part of accessibility is that it needs to be run early and often. It's not something you can do once uh, just before releasing or once and forget about it. It is a journey and it needs to be as part of the development cycle in each one of the different steps. Okay, that's why I can't wait to use GitHub Actions with that so it can be automated and be sure that people can put on production something that is not accessible. Um, speaking of GitHub Actions, so you mentioned that we can find you on GitHub. Where exactly can we find you on, on GitHub? Oh, yes. Um, so we have different repositories and bringing over um, accessibility insights uh, for web in our GitHub Actions. And we also have accessibility insights for Windows and accessibility insights for Android as well as our CICD pipelines. Um, and very easy way to find all of that, and you only need to remember one single link, is to go to accessibilityinsights.io. And we have very rich documentation and all the information you need, and it will let you know how you can contribute in each one of our repositories. OK, so you even accept contributions, so if someone is, is listening to us and wants to contribute to the, to the tool, go and check out and contribute. Yes, please. Okay, well, that was very interesting. Um, again, thank you, Fernanda, for your talk, and we continue the conference. See thank you. you for having us. See ya. Bye-bye. So that was the last presentation of the conference. We hope you liked it and that you learned a lot. If you were not able to attend the whole conference, or if you want to watch the presentation of the track in French, be aware that the conference will be available in replay on YouTube, on the Mug TV channel and Microsoft developer channels. So you can watch it again at your own pace whenever you want. Thank you. Bye. Bye.